This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. By popular demand, Place to Be Nation Wrestling returns to the Dirty South for talking WCW, an episodic wrestler showcase designed to educate, evaluate, and entertain, with matches spanning the intimate stage of Techwood Studios to the heights of Space Mountain. Talking WCW presents the best worst and most surreal offerings from world championship wrestling so cast your gaze to the turner tron with hosts jennifer smith tim capel and greg phillips place me nation hi welcome to talking wcw i'm jennifer smith i'm here with the mr wonderful to my mrs wonderful tim capel how you doing tim Jenny, we are Mr. and Mrs. Wonderful. We are wonderful. We are the Mr. and Mrs. Wonderful. Uh, so great to be back here again. And I keep wondering, when is the bloom going to come off the rose, right? We are, what, about six episodes deep now? And yes. still kind of my favorite podcast going on right now. No, low-key favorite I, it's never going to go school. off the rose, man. We're blooming forever. Right. But we're not just a couple. We're a trio. Mm. Who else have we got? We got our friend, Greg Phillips. Hey, Greg. What's causing all this? Mm. <laughs> Why, it's the custom made from head to toe. <laughs> Talking WCW crew. Mm. I am proud to be here among the faces of fear. The Butcher, Kevin Sullivan, mm. Avalanche, we're all here, and we're ready to take on another exciting WCW topic. This has just lit my world on fire since we started this podcast. I'm I'm ready, I'm raring to go, excited to talk a little Southern Fried Wrestling with y'all. Woo! Indeed, and we have a very Southern Fried edition of Talking WCW tonight. I think this was my pick, right? Uh, Our topic of the evening, we're going to be looking at some War Games matches. So, yeah, a little bit of a departure from our typical format of looking at wrestlers. Of course, we also looked at a tag team duo of wrestlers. Here we're doing a concept, talking entirely War Games matches tonight. We have chosen three... I don't know. I just thought it would be seasonally appropriate because when I think of war games, well, I kind of think of Fall Brawl, to be honest with you. But technically, technically, war games was a tradition that started in the summertime. In fact, started the inaugural war games. It was held on July 4th, Independence Day Hmm. of 1987. How about that? And it continued to be a summertime tradition for a little while. It was uh, a touring match at first, meant to to showcase the Four Horsemen as a as a faction, as you did back in those days. One of the the many great inventions of the endlessly creative Dusty Rhodes, mm-hmm. American Dream. He was the subject of our second episode. Um, I guess I'll also say it was one of the many. Pro wrestling concepts owing its origins to Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. <laughs> um, why is that so weirdly influential? Like, do we have a tally of all of the things that that came out of the Mad Max franchise and, and made its way into wrestling? Yeah, so you've got the Road Warriors, you've got Lord yeah. Humongous, you've mm-hmm. got uh, the uh, Match Beyond War Games, you've got the Thunderdome. Mm-hmm. The Thunderdome. Uh, the Thunderdome Cage. Uh, what else do you have coming out of those movies? Um, gosh, can you think of anything else? I'm, I'm sure there's others we're missing. Pretty yeah. much every indie gimmick that was a knockoff of the Road Warriors from the 80s, every little right. territory that had their own Road Warriors was 
ultimately a throwback to Mad Max. I guess it's because it was one of those action movies that was just, you know, my dad talks about it reverently, those Mad Max movies that, like, they really captured the imagination of young, primarily male, defiant young wrestling fans back in the day. Mm -hmm. Is your dad Jim Ross? (laughs) In some ways. In some ways. Imagine that. Well, it also came out, a lot of names came out of it that are just fun to say. Like, how fun is Lord Humongous to say? <laughs> Let's face it. Oh, Lord Humongous. Mm, that's good stuff. I-, I can tell you guys, I wish I had been old enough to attend and truly appreciate, like, this match in its earliest touring form, like when they were doing the, the Hal Show circuit. Um, I'm looking at some of those early war games, and I see on July 15th, 1988, in the Richmond Coliseum. I mean, we're talking 20 minutes from where I live right now. Uh, Sting, Lex Luger, Nikita Koloff, and the Road Warriors versus the Four Horsemen with James J. Dillon. My God, to see that live, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Holy shit. And can I just say uh, those teams are wildly mismatched. Yeah. The horsemen get saddled with the horsemen get saddled with JJ. With and Dylan, the, and yeah. The, and the good guys get Sting, Luger, and the Road Warriors. Well, I was thinking the opposite, but sure. Well true. <laughs> <laughs> but y'all know how I feel about Sting and Luger, so Right. Oh, good lord. <laughs> Wait, does that extend to Sting? Also, I thought it was just a Luger thing. With it's you. mostly Luger, a little bit of Sting, especially after the matches I had to watch for this oh, episode. Oh, man. Well, oh, my goodness. Shadowing there. <laughs> well, that should prove to be some interesting discussion as, as the evening continues on. Um, but I would just tell folks, if you want to watch some, like, extremely bingeable, like, a Addictive pro wrestling. Um, look at those. I would say, I don't know. Greg, back me up here. Maybe two months worth of mm-hmm. World Championship wrestling's. Those episodes on the network mm-hmm. leading up to that inaugural Great American Bash again, July fourth, nineteen eighty seven. You will see some of the best promos ever. The best build. Tremendously fun squash matches. It. I feel like it really captures that intimate feel of, of going out to the matches, as you say, mm-hmm. at your local arena. Arena? Wow. <laughs> arena. <laughs> That's the arena, Cole. Taz <laughs> joining Good. our podcast. <laughs> ECW. I haven't even really been drinking, and that just happened. So, But yeah, going out to your local arena on a Saturday night. But it's, uh, all right, I'm good now. It's a podcast, and it's out there for all the world to see. Just like my uh, my vocal um, faux pas there. Well, and and it, it, to your point, Tim, these are great promos that make you really want to see the good guys kick the crap out of the bad guys. Like yeah. it's just the horsemen are such dirt bags, <laughs> and Dusty and his crew are like superheroes. And you can't wait to see them show up and kick the bad guy's asses. But you're not sure that they will because the horsemen have a way of sneaking out on top every single time they've gotten into a confrontation with Dusty and his friends. So, awesome build. And all that is to say, we did not actually choose any of the uh, war games from the 80s. Um, (laughs) Not because we don't like them. It's just, I I think it's um, well covered at this point through yes. various podcasts and rem- remembrances. So we're going to actually take it over to the 90s. Uh, you know, WCW would involve into this great, huge national concern, inherit the great NWA tradition, and War Games has been repositioned as a annual event. So... Our first match is going to be from Russell War, 1991. That was February 24th from the Arizona Veterans Memorial Coliseum. I was in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, who the heck chose this match? That was me. I chose this match. Um, okay. <clears throat> this was the first War Games match that I ever saw in my young life, or any life, I suppose. And... 
uh, yeah, it, it always stuck out with me uh, from the time I first saw it. I remember feeling like this had been built to for a long time because the horsemen had sort of been uh, lingering around. Like we, I remember as a young fan, I thought the horsemen were pretty much vanquished after the Great American Bash in 1990 when Sting finally won the world championship from, from the Nature Boy. But like a cockroach that just won't go away, the Nature Boy came back to reclaim his title in January of 91. And uh, Sting and his friends continued to just be cheated and robbed at every t- turn, every corner, by Flair, uh, Arn Anderson, uh, Barry Windham, and, of course, Big Sid Vicious. So this was the big culmination of uh, Sting and his bu- – really, if you want to take it back to the ill-fated Dudes with Attitudes era of WCW, this was really paying off all of that. And so I chose this because it's one that – Stuck out in my mind, and it's one that I always thought had an interesting finish because, as you know, Tim, typically in war games, the uh, the heroes come out on top, but uh, this one was a little bit different. Yes, indeed it was, and I thought this was a really strong faction of the horsemen, too, even maybe not the most classic version. Once you get out of the 80s, it's it's a little bit hard to not only keep track of all the different iterations of the horsemen but to look at like good versions of them at the same yes. time yes but i mean you do have i mean you've got flair and anderson of course have to have um you know at least half classic representation here uh but you've got sid vicious of course i mean making his mark early in the the wrestling industry and barry windham as well i mean can't go wrong with buried i mean at this point he's getting a little bit um up there it was always it was always like your mileage may vary once you get past i don't know 1989 barry windham uh he can be hit or miss yeah for sure yeah yeah but uh i mean he still brings it here so Mm -hmm. and that's that's who the match actually starts out with right it's it's going to be windham and Pillman for the pay, the face side of the equation. So um, smart way to start off, right, with your, well, from a work rate standpoint, anyway. I don't know that the strategy of uh, Pillman going into the match, well, kayfabe injured, speaks well to the... Um, <laughs> the the ring IQ of the face is necessary. Well, yeah. Well, the way they sold it on commentary, I thought was pretty good though, because what what they the, now the the crack in WCW camera work didn't necessarily catch this, but uh, <laughs> apparently the 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 commentators Jr. and Dusty mentioned that Pillman kind of jumped the line and kind of jumped into the cage, mm-hmm. and that Sting and the Steiners were not happy about it, that they were urging him to come back, because they, they talked about on commentary that Pillman would probably be the last guy in the cage because he was mm-hmm. the guy coming in injured, and he had a bone to pick. But he had a bone to pick with Barry Windham, so he wanted to get in there and carry his weight and prove that he belonged. So I really I thought Pillman was, was really the star of this match. Mm-hmm. And uh, he came out and and really you know wanted to show that he had the heart of a lion. Uh, everything. One thing we've got to address before we get further into the match. I guess Arn must have been injured at this time because mm. instead of Arn Anderson, we get Larry Zabisco uh, yeah. side of the horse now. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I should have done research on this. And I apologize, and I will commit Harry Carey on myself later on <laughs> by watching a Cubs game, but. Uh, <laughs> But I'm just curious as to why Larry Zabisco was subbing for Arn here. Was it, was it an injury? Was it, you know, did, did Arn uh, have too many cat baths the night before and couldn't make a <laughs> match? I mean, I don't. I just don't know what the what the deal is here. Um, I, I think he was just hung over from the night before <laughs> when he yacked in a potted plant in a hotel <laughs> and had to be propped up by you his know, best. <laughs> as much as I do love Arn Anderson and watching him wrestle, I'm kind of okay with him on the sidelines in those pair of jeans that he's wearing tonight. Mm, well, I can't be a little bit, a little bit hurts. It, it helps me a little bit, even though well, I and, can't see and him. The- and also, Jenny, just imagine this. It, it, with Arn, you don't get the lovely guttural moans of Larry Zabisco. <laughs> when he comes in, ah! <laughs> You don't know what kind of, you know, moans Arn Anderson has, quite frankly. They might be guttural. A man can, man can dream. <laughs> All I know is he doesn't moan like Larry Zabisco, who's 
pretty much here to get his ass kicked. Oh, for uh, sure. Yeah. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that is the one um, sort of um, drawback here is that not only do we not have Arn Anderson in the match as a participant, we do have Larry Z, and it's sort of, uh, you know, could have done maybe a little bit better there. I mean, he's not a he's not an illogical choice as a replacement. He just, he's Larry Zabisco. He kind of sucks. I mean, what do you say? He's like the special friend of the friend group there mm. with the horsemen. I mean, he just he stood out because it's like you've got the four horsemen, yeah. Ben Bishop, <laughs> Rick Flair, exactly, Mark Anderson, Barry Windham, and Larry Zabisco. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and I'll I'll give them this though because I remember when I rented this VHS as a kid, uh, the Wrestle War VHS. I remember watching it and I was thinking, oh well, actually Sting's. Sting's team is probably going to win because Abisko is the weak link. Mm. Um, Pillman comes out and starts out on fire with Barry Windham. They're slugging it out, and Pillman is really trying to get retribution on Windham for his injuries that, that he had incurred, apparently, uh, the night before, I guess. Uh, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so Pillman is, is laying it in to, to Windham, busting him open pretty early in the match. And then uh, uh, the horsemen, uh, this is the craziest part about these matches, guys. Three matches we watched for this show, as usual. Every damn one of them, the heels won the coin toss. I, Can you imagine? It sounds like if a conspiracy to me. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm saying, Jim Ross. Mm-hmm. It sounds like a conspiracy to me because I, I just can't believe. You expect me to believe that there's not some sort of uh, maybe somebody on the championship committee for WCW. Oh, my God. You know, it has it out for 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 the for the heroes. You know, I don't know, but uh, mm. nonetheless, the heels went get the advantage here. Advantage, even you get. Yes, uh, thank you. You get Psycho Sid comes in at some. I can't remember if he was second or third in the match, but he he wrecked. I believe shot. Sid was last for the heels, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, you're probably right. Sid He's Sid kind of their ace in the hole. Clean up. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. And uh, uh, so you get Flair in, you get Larry Z in. And they're you know they're doing their thing they're they're uh, dub- doubling up on 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 the baby faces uh, of course uh, uh, Sting comes in and just clears house like my uh, you guys know but me as a diehard Sting fan probably my favorite part of this whole match was when Sting first comes into the cage because the oh, crowd yeah. in this Arizona crowd was kind of not the best in my opinion mm-hmm. for some of these shows that we watched but. They freaking came to life when Sting got in that cage and hit that double clothesline on, mm-hmm. uh, I think it was on uh, Flair and Wyndham. He lays them both out with the double clothesline, and that crowd freaking goes nuts. I thought the roof was going to blow off the building. Uh, so he comes in, gets this huge fired-up moment, um, and then anytime either of the Steiner brothers comes into the match, it's electric. Oh, yeah. Um, Steiner line, Steiner line. It's it's Stein, interesting. I got a start line. <laughs> it it is an interesting match structure where you you start off with your work rate guys. I mean that makes all the sense in the world. But next in it's going to be Flair. You figure you kind of save him for for later um, and get that you know late in the match star power. But no, he's coming in next for the heels. Um, they keep that up with Sting coming in next for the faces. So it was like, holy crap, in this middle stretch of the match, we've got, we're pulling out our big guns, you know? Well, and the I longer like the way... you can keep Rick in there bleeding, the better, honestly. You well, this that. is true, yeah. A gentle breeze blows through the cage at one point, and Rick busts an artery. <laughs> uh, but no, yeah, it's, I like the psychology of it in this case, because, okay, so Flair comes in second, probably unforeseen, by Sting's team. So obviously when so when Wyndham's in there, Pillman's got the issue with Wyndham. So Pillman's gonna go straight for Wyndham. Yeah. And when Flair gets in there, it makes sense to me that Sting has the issue with Ric Flair. So he's not gonna let Flair get, he he knows this is his chance to get his hands on Flair for sure. So I get like even though I agree with you, it's kind of a weird structure you'd think Flair would protect himself and go last. But uh in this case, it since they switched it up, it made sense for the baby faces to counter with Sting versus having one of the Steiners come in there after Flair. And then, you know, yeah. Sid comes in as a heavy hitter. Uh, or not Sid, uh, Zabisco comes in. Nobody really has an issue with him, but Rick comes in. And then S- Sid and Scott Steiner being the two, like, 
cleanup hitters really makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah. And as as you mentioned before, the idea that uh, Pillman jumped the line, maybe Sting was supposed to be in there first anyway. So mm-hmm. they're trying to, to recollect and, and go back to their, their initial strategy. So, And I did think that was a, a good dodge that you pointed out, by the way, that Pillman really shouldn't be in there first, um, arguably shouldn't be in there at all, but he just, uh, his, his emotions got the better of him. So I appreciate that, that touch on commentary saying, Hey, they're, they're not sticking to the game plan here. And because they've gotten, they've become too emotional. This may be their downfall. And as we see in the closing moments of the match, well, what happens here? Yes. So the, 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 the two sides go to war. There's blood everywhere. They're, uh, they're, <laughs> it was humorous to me that, that a couple of things, they're, they repeat a few of the same spots. Like, for instance, mm-hmm. every time somebody, at, at a certain point, the horsemen have to give up on trying to smash Rick Flay, or Rick Steiner's head into the cage. Because every time <laughs> they do it, they throw him into the cage, and he just looks at him. <laughs> he just sits there and turns around and looks at him. And then the heel begs off. Uh, or or then or then if it's Sid just stands there like an idiot and then tries to do it again and it doesn't work again do uh, it, and then do it. let me do it again let me do it again. <laughs> no God no so uh, uh, but then the other thing that I noticed that I never I swear I don't remember ever noticing this as a kid Sid calling his spots louder than oh, I ever my heard so a wild. wrestler call his spots like just right on camera having a conversation with yeah. Rick Steiner all right you ready now yeah. Rick Steiner yeah. <laughs> Huh? Yeah. All right, let's go. <laughs> I thought I was being weird by noticing that. <laughs> no, not at all, Jenny. It was blatant. Like, I can imagine what the audience was thinking at that time. Like, you know, Pillman, Pillman's chopping away on Sid, and Sid falls to the ground, and Sid yells at him, Put me in the figure four! <laughs> <laughs> hey, why don't you know he puts him in the figure four? <laughs> Oh, the best part of that is he's like, put me in the figure four. So Pillman grabs his legs, and before he puts him in the figure four, he stomps his testicles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good time. Anyway, yeah, so I just thought, I, I'm glad you guys noticed that too, because it was driving me nuts. Which he, it never did as a kid. Sid does. That's a Sid thing. He just, he does not give a shit about calling spots. I, I've noticed that more and more as I've, watched Sid matches and as I've gotten older because he's someone who is um extremely conversant, let's say, in the ring, uh but in a way that's extremely blatant at the same time. <laughs> so gotta yeah. love him. So speaking of Sid, uh the 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 culmination of this match, the story of this match, Pillman, who's got his shoulder taped up from his terrible injury that he suffered, he makes it through the entire match it looks like Sting's team is, is at least even with the Horsemen, maybe even has the advantage, but it's back and forth, certainly. Mm-hmm. And in one, and uh, we should mention, by the way, that War Games is, at this time, uh, unlike what you see with NXT, I believe. Or do they, Does NXT use the two rings? They just use the one, right? Mm, I think it's two. Mm-hmm. They've got two rings, but okay, it's, a, it's an, yeah. open, open it's an open air cage. That's right, yeah. yeah. So Which it's is two interesting... Um, an interesting variation on the concept. Well, I feel like the open air cage looks cleaner on camera because, like, with this cage in particular, it sags quite a bit. Like, I don't yeah, think Klondike Bill was on his game on this night because... I would not have wanted to, to have Mick Foley and The Undertaker standing on top of oh, this no. particular structure. Oh, no. my God. Well, yeah, as we'll talk about in, in our next selection. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah um, uh, we almost had Hell in a Cell about, what, eight years before we actually got it. Whatever. But no, that's for later on. But yeah, so uh, it's a two-ring structure with a with a kind of a, what you think of as a Hell in a Cell uh, around it. But, unlike the Hell in a Cell, which tends to be really tall, uh, this cage has a pretty low roof, mm-hmm. which sets up cool spots like, um, not, well, I'll mention that in the next match, but uh, it sets up cool spots that you can do involving the roof of the cage. Uh, it also sets up some danger, like uh, guys that are trying to jump off the top rope, having to make sure that they don't bump their head onto the top of the, the cage. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the early portions of this match is, uh, it's the, they have this convoluted uh, explanation of the rules before everyone, sort oh of like God, he can yes. fumble. The, it feels look, like it lasts Rick, forever. The, the rules are, are actually very simple, <laughs> but yes, actually quite, quite complex. complex. 
Thanks. The rules. <laughs> the rules. So Gary Michael Capetta sits there for like uh, <laughs> what feels like 30 minutes explaining the rules to the audience. Yeah, and he I sounds see... confused as fuck. He doesn't yeah. know what Bumbling they are through his note cards. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, here are the rules <laughs> of war games. There are seven periods. <laughs> At the end of each period, a new period begins. This period lasts 30 days. If it goes beyond that, you may be pregnant. <laughs> gentlemen, whichever team gains the advantage, then wait for the other team to then equal the odds. And then, at the end of seven periods, the match beyond begins. The only way to win, by submission or surrender. Which was the difference? <laughs> right? I always wondered that. I, I couldn't wait to bring that question to you guys. What is the difference in surrender and submission? Please tell me. Somebody out there. In I the guess p- surrender means you don't have me in an actual submission hold. I'm just I done just give with up. this. I'm just done with this shit. I've had enough of this shit. I like. do not want to have a metal spike driven into my orbital socket. So you know what? Peace out. I, I both submit and surrender. <laughs> but, but no, yeah, so uh, Capetta takes forever to explain these rules, which really aren't that complex. No, they're, they they're are. They're not they as complex sound, as they like, make them seem. So, uh-huh. like, it seems yeah, like yeah. a, a not Yeah, situation. they could say it so much easier, and they just, yeah, like, yeah. like gunk it all up with all these stupid words. But then it leads to the match. they're watching it going, Jesus, give me a TNA reverse battle royal. I think I could follow it better. <laughs> It's like, and so so you have to get through the early portion of the match, the war games, to get to the match beyond, which is sure. submission or surrender, as they say, which we've established are essentially the same thing. So uh, we're in that portion of the match, and Sid somehow finds himself isolated in a ring with, with Brian Pillman. Hugest size disparity in the match. You've got big Sid, 6'9", 320 pounds. You got uh, Brian Pillman, who's about six foot even, if that, and and maybe two hundred and fifteen or twenty pounds, and and Sid uh, just annihilates him, right? Just like yeah. gets him in a position for his big finisher, the power bomb, mm-hmm. pit, hoists him for the power bomb. Unfortunately, Pillman's legs clip the top of the cage, and Sid just spikes Brian Pillman right on the oh. back of his noggin, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, and then. Whereas in today's day and age, that would end the match. They would they would send medical personnel in to check on Brian Pillman. Instead, Big Sid picks him up and does it does again. Does it again, but and like just, more carefully this time. Yes, so he's like, I'm carefully. not going to break your neck this time because it's already broken. So now, now that I've already concussed you and yeah. possibly crippled you for life, yeah, I'm going to gently lay you down with this power bomb. Which I have to think that the finish of the match was really and truly supposed to be Sid hitting two power bombs on yes. Brian yes. Pillman. Yeah. Uh, because by all rationale, you, you don't do that second, whether it's a botch or not, right? You do not do that second right. power bomb, repeat the spot because it was fucked up the first time. Like he could be in a bad way. That was a pretty sick landing that he mm-hmm. took. Fully, was, like, on the back of his neck. I was going to ask you guys, did that result in a legit injury? I believe it did. Um, I, I think Tim Tim might have more historical info on this, but I remember as a, when I was first getting on the Internet, that was always the uh, the, the word was that um, – was that that was that Pillman was legitimately injured from it? Um, now he was yeah. have a broken neck, but I think he had a concussion. I think it was one of those like it, he knocked it knocked him out basically, and uh, and so. But I agree with Tim. That was I think that was that was going to be the finish regardless. And they you know because Ellie Gante, mm. the uh, the 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 friend the the he comes out to protect his as well, Jr. The, says, the Lothario of Place to Be Nation as well. Yes, great Facebook <laughs> follow if you guys have a chance. Sure. Oh my um, God. But yeah, so he runs out to help as Jr. refers to Brian Pillman, his little buddy, Brian <laughs> Pillman, and 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 Eligante comes into the cage, and uh, Sid just kind of backs away, and Gante Gigante checks on on Pillman, and he waves it off. He waves off the match. He says, "No, Pillman cannot continue." Um, which, if I'm Sting or the Steiner brothers, I might be a little ticked off about the fact that. Some dude who isn't even in the match was able to surrender on behalf of my team. But yeah, right. 
Uh, but him. yes. So because of that, the Horseman, in I believe the first time that had been televised anyway, won a War Games match. How about that? Yes. Usually all the Arn matches I, I watch, he loses. Somehow. Yes. <laughs> But in this yes. case, he wins as a manager. Yes, there we go. Yes, now, the, the, one... the horseman and Larry Zabisco. I guess he was he was their secret weapon, right? That's, that's, yes. that's who they was. needed to. Oh! Oh, he, he took a boot to the face uh, mm-hmm. by Sid that had me like pausing and rewinding so I could watch it over and over again. Apparently, Scott Steiner is getting ready to enter my apartment. Uh, there's a <laughs> siren going on in the background, so. Uh, maybe I I called it a Hurricane Ron instead of a Frankenstein. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. But um, in any of the sharpies are coming out. Yeah, oh, hopefully boy. I could hopefully I could survive the rest of the podcast. But one thing I wanted to mention about this match also is this may be the all time worst collection of early nineties hair because yeah. you've got Ric Flair in his I don't his weird schoolboy haircut from getting like, a jump on his 1996 haircut yes yes, yes. Rick flair, yeah. Ric flair with his dangerously short haircut his bowl cut is basically yes. a rick flair bowl cut and then you've got uh uh barry windham with a similar short hairstyle that looks terrible on him mm-hmm. uh and then you've got the the sid hair which is always magnificent oh uh you've got the scott steiner mullet which is in rare form as always and uh, Sting's spiky hair, and then you've got uh, uh, Rick Steiner's uh, normal Rick Steiner hair, which always looks weird as well. Yeah, just Pretty kind much, of assume. you got to give it to Larry Z. He might be the only guy in the match with what you could classify as normal hair. Pillman's all got his perm going, you know. Oh my so, god, yeah. I mean, this is this is an maybe a great hodgepodge of these early '90s hairstyles. Would you say? A Danny hodgepodge. The Danny Hodge pod. <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah, it's it's a tremendous cross section of, of hairstyles that weren't necessarily <clears throat> even um contemporary at the time, but it is what it is. It's wrestling. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So so what did you uh what did you make of this match, Jenny? No, I really liked it. Um I, I liked um Pillman biting everybody because that was funny to me <laughs> yes and biting the open wound as well yeah that was he just I, I, in my notes i wrote biting brian pillman <laughs> mm, <laughs> that's biting brian <laughs> biting brian yeah i was hoping you would say that uh no it was it was awesome uh, i liked it a lot and i was i was kind of concerned that the cage would fall in on them at some point <laughs> it, it threatened to come down that's for sure and I will Dusty, say that Dusty at the end was like marking out, right? He was. Oh yeah. He was yeah. Kind of well, that that out. in the spot where Pillman gets dumped on his on his dome. Yeah. D- Dusty, I'm pretty sure goes Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that for what's kind of a let's face it, rinky dink, shitty cage. Uh, the visual of the pyro as the yes. cage is being lowered mm-hmm. was yes. very. And something that I don't think is done enough. It it mm. gave it that feeling of prestige it, until you look at the cage itself and you're sort of thinking, wow, that's kind of like that's it. But yeah. I think that's everyone's reaction when seeing a War Games for the first time. But it worked so effectively, just that claustrophobic nature of this match where you do have limitations. You can't do all of the aerial moves that you would normally expect from a lot of these guys uh but it does it also gives you cool spots like sting who's pressing flair into the roof of the cage because it's it's low enough to do so yeah i I forgot that he did that spot in this match too because that's an that that spot is amazing every time i see it like i just love that when when he's pressing the guy up into the roof amazing and uh, and uh and you've got flares wailing on top of it ah Fantastic. Exactly. Fantastic. They also did stuff. this like simultaneous submission hold like across both rings with mm-hmm. all like all four pairs of guys. That was pretty well timed and looked really cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All the faces putting the heels yeah. in the figure four. That that was mm-hmm. a really just vis- a visual feast right yeah. there. And it's always fun to see how the heels get out of it by like reaching across and raking. Whoa, so there's got Scott Steiner. 
I don't know what the hell's going on outside, guys, but it, it doesn't sound like anything good. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so they always have to reach across and rake the eyes of the other guy that's holding their friend in the figure four or whatever. So it's 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 fun. It, it, it was it's a fun. It's war games is always fun for the most mm-hmm. part, but this mm-hmm. was a fun match. Yeah, it's it's hard to fuck up a war games. So I w- I will say about this one though, guys. I picked this one and I still like this match, but it's not as good as I remembered it being. <laughs> like I, I I remembered it in my mind's eye being this like classic, amazing match, and it's really really good, but. It kind of I, I I'm starting to see what Tony Schiavone has said about War Games, which is that they always kind of have weak finishes, and yeah, this one yeah. uh, it just kind of like it's a good finish, like it's a logical finish, but it kind of deflates the crowd. Um, I didn't like Eligante getting involved. Um, I thought he stood out like a sore thumb, and there were points in the match where they were just repeating stuff over and over again, yeah. like the ramming Rick Steiner into the cage and no selling it. Uh, uh, Sid was particularly egreg- egregious about this. <laughs> um, and, but, uh, but so it's a really good match. It's a really fun match, but I have to say, this is one of the matches we watched on our show. One of the few matches we watched on our show that actually does not quite match up to my memory of it. I would say I, I liked it as, as much as I probably always have which is quite a lot i mean i i think it's is it one of the best wcw matches um maybe i mean it's it's kind of up there for me uh so i it didn't really hold any surprises i would say but i've always pretty much dug that match weak finish aside uh point taken there for sure but it is sort of an unfortunate hallmark of of war games matches uh, Jenny, you started to say something. No, I um, I just thought that um, if, in a, in a match where you can't like pin somebody, don't you mm-hmm. don't you kind of expect sort of weak finishes? I mean, you can make like a submission like exciting, but it's not as mm-hmm, exciting sure. as pinning somebody anyway. Right. Well, I, That's I guess. A good point. Yeah. I guess my thought was always, even as a kid watching these, in a match like that, you expect the finishing hold to be something like Sting Scorpion Deathlock or Ric Flair's Figure Four or Luger's Torture Rack or some kind of submission like that, or a Magnum TA situation where a guy just gets beat down so severely that he just gives up because he's being he's in threaten he's in danger of losing his career because he's been beaten so severely. But I don't necessarily want an eight foot tall guy to walk into the cage and yeah. wave the match off. You yeah. Know, like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or and we'll talk about the finish of the next match, which I think is actually a lot better than this match, mm-hmm. but we'll talk about the finish of the next one. Yeah. Well, very good segue because we're going just a year later to 1992. This was again at Russell War. This one from May 17th of that year, Jacksonville Memorial Coliseum in your state of residence, Jenny. Mm-hmm. And this was the match that you chose. It is. Why did you choose this one? I chose this match because of the sheer like star power in the ring. Um, yeah. It, the list of names for this match is like, holy shit. <laughs> What it is fuck? huge. Um, and, and, you know, the previous match had, had some of these names and also amazing names. But there's something about this match uh, or this, like, combination of people that that sort of set it apart for me. Um, mm-hmm. And it's from Jacksonville, which is a, a great city, in my opinion. And, um, and of course, um, Tony looks... Tony looks real good. I, I think I've said before, ninety two is Tony's year. As far as is that yeah, you, you you have you have said that. Yes. Um, do you agree with that? I would agree with that. I mean, why? Who? No. Man, I kind of like that. I kind of like that eighty three Tony with the that mustache. Is, yeah, yeah. That's a good choice. Yeah. It's valuable. Was there ever really a bad Tony? Other than like maybe like nineteen ninety nine Tony. <laughs> 
Now, what's wrong with 1999, Tony? <laughs> See, I thought you might disagree with that <laughs> assessment. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> well, I mean, he didn't want to be there, but but that he still true. he still looked the part, is what you're saying? Yes. So in this match, you have but, Sting's Squadron, which is real fun to say, um, mm-hmm. which I shortened to Sting's Squad to make it easier for me and more contemporary for these kids these days. Yeah. Um, which consists of Sting. We're Barry, all about the abreves on this right. show. <laughs> Barry Wyndham. Wyndham. Um, Once again. Dustin Rhodes. Ricky Barry, Steamboat. Barry Wyndham. Barry Wyndham without anything uh, shoved up his keister, by the yes. way. Yes, well, as despite. far as we know. We don't get confirmation <laughs> of that thus far. And then you got Nikita Koloff. So, yeah, that's weird. A little bit. A little bit weird. And then you have the Dangerous Alliance, which, I mean, okay, Steve Austin, Rick Rude, Arn Anderson, Bobby Eaton, and, of course, Larry Z. The Cruncher. <laughs> Once again, yes. <laughs> With Polly Dangerously and Medusa. By the way, by, I, by my count in this match, if you count managers or if you count Medusa, eight hall, eight WWE Hall of Famers in this match. Yeah. I mean, wow. it, it's just fucking stacked. And and everybody is so beautifully tanned. Um, yes. And, and and their entrance when they walk in they the dangerous lines in particular when they walk in single file it it it, it uh grabs my attention right away uh they fat looks better brown than white boy they look good <laughs> I love you for that down there uh on that ramp and they're just everybody looks tight and fit and tan and big and just fucking ready to fucking wrestle <laughs> even even bobby eaton yes looks, looks, oh yeah looks more live than than you might expect um, Don't knock him. and then of course um you get another rickety ass looking cage um even <coughs> more poorly put together than, than the previous <laughs> year i do believe uh it looks i bad. thought the ceiling was a little higher if if any yeah maybe not a, a lot touch. but maybe maybe a skosh uh, didn't seem quite as treacherous, you know, getting people up for for moves. power bombs or yeah, any yeah, moves. But, to but be honest, notice, yeah, Rick, Rick Root. They do that spot in the match where Sting is pressing Rick Root into it, mm-hmm. and they're able to do more reps on it because Root like gets full extension with his arms because the, the yes. cage is a little bit higher up. But yeah, yeah, I I did notice that as well. But yes, to to your point, Jenny, very rickety, oh. very very dangerous. And so uh, you got Paul Lee on the on the outside with his blueprints of love, love that. What what are we doing? Like it? What does it look like on the blueprints? It's is it two squares? I mean, because yeah. and the beauty of it is when the camera comes in to look at it, Steve Austin steps in the way and puts his hand <laughs> in front of it. It I love this. To me, it's little shit like that that Paul Lee has yeah. always done that adds to the, the, the immersion and like, he's genuinely strategizing. And if you listen to what he's saying, he's saying, we're going to start with you, Steve, Austin, you're going to go first. We're going to try to win the toss. If we win the toss, Mm -hmm, we're going to get the advantage. If we don't win the toss, we're going to do it this. And it's going to, he's going to go last. I love that. Now what what would have been great. What would have been great is is if he'd said, now we're the heel. So we're going to win the coin toss. (laughs) You're going to go in, you're going to blade in the first two and a half minutes. <laughs> in my mind, that's what he was saying. Oh. And then and then Dusty was saying, I mean, JR was saying, <laughs> they're getting it on hard and fast. Yeah, they're getting, hard and fast. <laughs> they're getting it on hard and fast here. <laughs> what are you talking about over there, Jim Ross? Contain yourself. <laughs> And these are guys who are huge stars at the time. I mean, you've got the star power of of Sting, of course, and Rude, and I mean, even Everybody. Barry Windham at at the time. And then you've got dudes who are not necessarily Steamboat. My God, yeah. uh, guys who are not necessarily enormous stars at the time, but will become so later on. With Dustin, really his his first year, uh, not his first year in the business, totally, but first year getting a, a showcase in WCW, um, Austin as well. I mean, mm-hmm. Jesus, just think about, just, think about has come just in like mm-hmm. eight months in WCW at this point. Exactly. 
And and hard to believe. And then you get Medusa um, climbing the cage. Um, once, mm-hmm. um, once I think most most of them are in there at this point. Her and Sting are not in there, but Arn is in there. So she drops a weapon to to Arn. <laughs> Yeah, so the weapon, breakfast. of course, being a gigantic a f- 1992 cell phone. Phone, yeah, like okay, and then it looks like she barely clears uh, the roof of the cage as she's trying oh, to climb down. Oh my god! It. Yeah, she's like she. It dips down to yeah. such an absurd degree that it's reminiscent of that Foley and Undertaker Hell in it a is. Cell match. And then Sting comes up after her, and he weigh he has to weigh twice her mm-hmm. what she weighs. Yeah, and like and and it, I'm like I'm watching it. I'm like. He is so lucky that that cage didn't snap because he would have blown out his knee again. Oh yeah, he would have yeah. he would have fallen to the ring and and that yeah. probably would have ended his career. Um, so, but yeah, not Klondike Bill's greatest uh, oh, structure. Bless his little heart. <laughs> and and like you mentioned, the crowd uh, the year before was kind of mad for you, but this crowd was super hot. Oh, they were awesome. Yeah, they were great. They were getting on Paulie's case right from the get go with Paulie sucks. <laughs> um, they they were this crowd was into everything and everybody, and they were doing that that what I love that who 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 every time somebody punches <laughs> mm-hmm, somebody, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so good. Um, and okay, so I'm gonna make this comparison, and I I don't have any personal experience for. In my imagination, this match looks like a wrestling orgy, and what I mean by that <laughs> is that when they when you get everybody in the ring, like on the match beyond, and everywhere the camera pans, there's something interesting going on, right? So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it, there's some sort of pairing going on and some sort of thing that you really want to see, whether it's Sting, like lifting Rick Rude up on, uh, like power lifting him up onto the fucking roof of the cage. And then it, everywhere you turn is... It's just amazing action. So my mind, Absolutely. of course, immediately went to, like, this must be, like, what an orgy is. Um, <laughs> it's like a, a wrestling orgy is what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, but but, but, there, are, but there are orgies. I'm, I'm, cer- I, I'm not speaking from experience <laughs> here. But I'm certain that there are orgies where there's some people that aren't doing any work. You know, there's some people that are just kind of, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. enjoying the action, you know, getting the, you know, just going to lay there and enjoy the, 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 the love that dare not speak its name <laughs> uh, with multiple partners, you know. Well, but, I mean, but your imaginary orgy is quite, you know, more laid back than say my imaginary orgy because but 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 to your point though in the, this is more of a high this is a, this is an or a wrestling orgy where everyone's putting in the work right yeah. everybody is doing something yes. everybody is everybody is hitting the right spot for what they're trying to do arguably you do want an orgy to contain less blood um mm. well, again your mileage may vary <laughs> let's not well, speak for jenny y'all know me so <laughs> yeah right <laughs> Just putting the that out there. Better. <laughs> yeah, I, I get what you're saying, though. In terms of just the action, there's so much happening, especially once you reach the match beyond yes. portion of yes. War Games, where it's almost like there's so much happening. The production values of 1992 WCW like can't really even keep up with it. They can't you know, right. you feel like. You almost feel like it's great. Don't get me wrong, but you almost feel like you're missing things because oh, you're absolutely. Not get... You'll hear this big pop for something and this loud impact yeah. on the mat, and it's not on the screen. Yeah, and they and then yeah. Jr. will say like, "My God, Sting just did a 450 splash." <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, and then Bobby Eaton comes in, and the crowd goes mild. I mean, <laughs> I mean, they don't give a two Bobby. fucks about Bobby Eaton. Yeah. No. But who do they give less of a fuck about, Bobby Eaton or Larry Z? I think the Larry cruncher. Z got a bigger pop. Oh my, the cruncher! The, the cruncher. cruncher! I hate that nickname. It's so <laughs> awful. They were so, trying so hard to get that over. Too. And he gets murdered again in this yes, match. He, <laughs> he comes in the match and instantly goes. Just, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Dustin takes him out. It's awesome. I don't know why my Larry Zabisco is Bobcat Goldthwait, but <laughs> nonetheless, there it is. Uh, 
Yeah, it's the there's so much action going on in this match constantly. Everybody is working hard. And what I love about it compared to the previous year is I feel like they don't repeat things as much. No, they Maybe don't. it's because there's more people in it. There's like one extra person on each team, but they don't find themselves repeating the same things over and over and over again. Uh, there's a lot of fighting, a lot of blood, a lot of punching, fisticuffsmanship, mm-hmm. biting of open fist wounds. Fisticuffsmanship, wow. That is uh, a- it is- Trademarked it's, term. <laughs> it's a lovely match in its own way. Yeah, it is, and you're you're not going to get the uh, the split screens or the instant replays, things that you are accustomed to mm-hmm. today. Mm-hmm. And I don't necessarily think that's the match cannot be faulted for that. It's it's more a, a issue of the production. Um, but that's something I did want to ask about that you just uh, hit hit upon, Greg was. Do you guys have a preference for the eight man or the ten man war games matches? I do now. I like the ten man better. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say as a kid, I preferred eight man because the first one I saw was an eight man. Mm-hmm. And good God, what the There's hell is Scott happening? Spanner again? <laughs> Jeez, I'm sorry, Scott. Favorite. I love you. You're one of my favorites. <laughs> man. Anyway. Um, the uh, but yeah, I, when I was a kid I always preferred eight man war games because that was one of the earliest ones I saw. But Having rewatched, I kind of prefer the 10 because, A, it makes the match go even longer, so that's cool, and B, there's just more stuff to do. Because I can understand how with just eight at that time in particular, you could run out of things to do. I think adding those extra people in makes it more interesting. So I, I I think the 10 man is my preference. Oh, and I was going to ask you guys, like towards the end of the match, Nikita Koloff comes in, mm. and then... He he protects Sting like he jumps in or he like pushes Sting out of the way or he jumps in the place of Sting. Anyway, he protects him, and then they have a bro hug. <laughs> yes. Right. So let me. This actually was a great moment. This actually okay. was a great storytelling moment. I felt like it was, but I didn't know that why. Makes no sense in out of context. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. We're watching it. There's yeah. no reason. And here's a here's a funny point about that as well. It's evident how little sense it makes out of context by Jesse Ventura. And I'll get to that in just a moment. So, backstory here: Nikita Koloff. Uh, it was in the, it was a big part of the NWA in the late '80s, right? He was the U.S. champion, I think, at some point in, in '88, a TV champion, something. He leaves. He goes away, take care of his uh, sick and ailing wife, and he leaves wrestling for a while. Comes back to WCW in '91, and when he comes back, he makes his re- reappearance in the 1991 WCW match of the year, which was Sting and Lex Luger versus the Steiner brothers. He interferes in the match. He goes to hit Lex Luger, who he's angry at. He blames Lex Luger for stealing the United States Championship from him years ago. And right. he misses that was their feud at the time. Yeah, he misses Luger because at the time Luger was a heel when Nikita left. So he misses Luger, hits sting instead and cost them the match against the steiners so this starts a feud between him and sting that turns into this uh kind of blood feud between them they they have a strap match or a chain match or some shit at great american bash and it sucked and and nikita koloff won At one point for reasons that i don't really know maybe he got injured i don't know nikita koloff vanishes shortly after that he beats sting and then he goes away and then in the build-up to this match koloff makes his return and so the, the story going into this match one of the stories going into this match was, can Sting's squadron trust Nikita? Because the last time anybody saw Nikita Koloff, he was attacking Sting and beating him down and stuff. And now the big question was, when it comes down to it, was this all an elaborate ruse? Was this all an elaborate setup by Koloff to get Sting in a cage, vulnerable? Mm-hmm. And he gets in there, and so Sting's still not sure whether to trust him. Uh, imagine that, Sting not trusting someone. <laughs> so... Oh. Nikita pushes him aside and takes the bullet for him, basically. And that's all that Sting needed to see to prove to him that Koloff was legit. So they do their high five and their bro hug, get a huge pop for it. And all right, everybody's suddenly like, yes, Nikita's on our side now. We can cheer for him again. That makes sense. Yes. But and here's the part about Jesse the Body. So Jesse Ventura joined WCW in October of 91, or November of 91, maybe. And uh, one of those two months. And so he clearly had done absolutely zero research on WCW's product <laughs> because they're, right. when they have that big moment, uh, uh, then they clothesline down the heels. And before they do the bro hug, 
uh, Jr. is like, now what's going to happen here? Mm-hmm. Can, can Sting trust Nikita Koloff? And, and then Jesse goes, I don't understand what their problem is. They're tag team partners, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, why is he hugging his own team member? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand what they're staring at each other for. Yeah, <laughs> they should be attacking the dangerous alliance. See, I appreciated that from my like novice point of view. So thank you, <laughs> and Jesse. JR, and, and Jr. just doesn't explain it. No, <laughs> he's just, he just he like just whatever. And starts Maybe. making uh, outlandish noises. Like, oh, oh, oh God. <laughs> This is on fire, folks! Ah! I think that's more evidence of my orgy comparison uh, when you have this Jim was, Ross orgasm. This is very much what an orgy would look like to JR, I think. I agree. If threw, maybe if you threw in Danny Hodge and, and you already have Austin and Brock, and you have Austin in there already, and maybe if you threw in Dr. Death, mm-hmm. then it would it would truly be an orgy. So, mm. And then, of course, uh, you have some fuckery here with the uh, ropes, Mm. And Larry Z becoming a, uh, what do you call, uh, I think JR said, I don't think he has ring maintenance on his mind here. Because um. <laughs> yeah, really. Jesse keeps saying, uh, yeah, I don't know why Bobby Eaton is taking the time to try to repair the ring. He <laughs> should be focused on wrestling. <laughs> and, like, I don't think he's trying to, I don't think he's got ring maintenance on his mind. Jess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was hoping you would say that. So he gets, yeah, Bobby Eaton gets, uh, he kind of like assembles. It's so funny because I, I re- like rewinded it a couple times to, so I could kind of watch what he was doing. And he takes things apart and then he like screws things together. <laughs> and then, like, what are you he doing? He is doing something like this. <laughs> it's hilarious. And then, um, it's so. I, I tell you, the carpenter Arn Anderson should have been doing that. <laughs> I agree. This this for for twenty five years, this has made no sense to me. So, the idea is to get the iron hook right and hit your opponent yes. with the iron hook. They have the iron hook; it's yeah. there. It's sitting on the mat, and Eaton picks up the hook and reattaches yeah. it. To the third <laughs> Maybe it was a timing issue. Like it's not time for this yet. And let me fix it real quick. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the it camera was... wasn't supposed to catch that. No, it's it's one of the know. things going on in the ring. He's going, by God, for all the shit happening in this ring right now, they're going to show me putting the ring back together. <laughs> <laughs> so Larry Zabisco ends up with it and then ends up hitting Eaton with it when he was trying to hit Sting, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. And, um... <laughs> and Sting gives Larry Z a karate chop to the yeah. neck. And then it's all over at that point. Um, yes. Ends up getting the submission. Also sort of anticlimactically. Um, yes. A lot of the first match that we watched. But it it sort of is what we're doing at this point. I'm with you with you know, on the idea of the heels slipping on a banana peel. But yeah. yes. the way that it's done here uh, leaves a little bit to be desired for yeah. sure. The weakest arm submission in the history of wrestling. Sting <laughs> right. did do well, though. Like I, I like Sting in this match, and it Thank takes you. a lot for me to say that. But yeah, he I was. Do. I thought Sting. I talked about Pillman in the first one. I think Sting was great. Yeah, and, he was. Um, but yeah, the and even like make trying to make that armbar look vicious, like the the the, the, the mm-hmm. yell yell that he let out when he put it on. Right. I I appreciate that, but gosh, guys. This match, if you put a, if you if this match ends with the Scorpion Deathlock yeah. instead of an arm lock, it's yeah. probably oh, yeah. my pick for the best WCW match of all time. Which I know it's a lot of people's pick wow. for that. Anyway. Uh, uh, that's how much I love this match. I freaking love this match. I, I had forgotten. It's actually better than I remembered it in my in my mind. Like it's to me, it's the best War Games, and uh, they have a, a, a finish. Right there, if 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 Zabisco misses Sting and hits Bobby in the back instead of right. on the arm, mm-hmm. and then Sting puts him in the Scorpion Deathlock and finishes it with that, yeah. I think it's it's an amazing finish. But as it is, I just can't get. It's behind. an easy fix. Yeah, it's an easy fix. I can't get behind that stupid arm lock being the being the end of the match. But uh, still, I. I just thought this match was amazing other than that. I think they tried to make up for it a little bit at the end because they had a little post-match fuckery um, with the Dangerous Alliance. And, you know, they're all blaming 
Larry Zabisco for being a fucking dumbass. As, as they should. <laughs> as they should. And uh, they're all kind of ganging up on him and yelling at him and Polly's in the, in the ring just kind of going nuts. So it's... Larry's going, ah! Yeah, it takes, I it, it takes a sting out of him a little bit. <laughs> Uh, that, that, that was that was great because uh, even on commentary, uh, Jr. is like, "It looks like Paul Lee is uh, blaming Larry Zabisco for what happened, as well he should, should. Jim Ross." <laughs> <laughs> I thought that Arn Anderson got some good shine in this yeah, match. Yeah, he did. Mm. He, looked really he gets good. a lot of his shit in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, DDT, Spinebuster, of course, bleeding uh, all over the place. Blood, oh, yes. He does uh, that does, great funk spot where he gets punched and then swings at the air. And then yes! Oh my god, I love when he does that. Well, he also does the Arn Anderson spot where he gets his head stuffed between the two yes! rings. Yes, yes! I also <laughs> love that. As they're, yeah. Uh, that may have been, you know, the source of some of his subsequent neck mm-hmm. problems. Well, but, yeah, um, perhaps. looks pretty cool, <laughs> I will say. A uh, lot of color in this match, too. You've got, uh, Wyndham and Austin and Dustin at some point. I don't remember when exactly Dustin got busted open, but wow, they cut to him at one point and he was a mess. Mm-hmm. Yep. So very Arn, cool. Arn stuff. gets busted as well. Right. Yep. Uh, the blood on on Wyndham's uh, tape fist that they made mm-hmm. such a big deal out of um, looks, you know, just really. Vi- it's one of those things that. It's not actually vicious at all in the context of a worked wrestling match, but looks like it is. Mm-hmm. And that's Which the illusion. Which is the point, of, right? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. the yeah, point. That's exactly. Oh, I super and, love this. And you said that people consider this like the best match of mm-hmm. WCW? A, a lot of people do. Some people do. I mean, clearly they're wrong about that, but I mean, it is high up there. Mm-hmm. In my opinion. It's great. And Paul Lee Dangerously was great in this match, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, he never shuts up the entire time, shouting <laughs> oh instructions from yep. ringside. Uh, he's he's outstanding. And uh, and Medusa as well. She does a great job with what, with what her role is. So it's one of those matches with a, a collection of talent that gosh, guy, this might be one of the greatest collections of talent in one match that we've, that we've ever seen. Absolutely. I can't argue so. with that. <laughs> Well, we talked about the matter of trust in this match, particularly pertaining to Sting here, and we're going to see that play out on a much more operatic stage Mm. in our next selection. But first, we've got to take a break, pay some bills. So we're going to do that here on Talking WCW. We'll come back and... Take it home with our final War Games match chosen by me. Please stick around and we will reveal that after the break. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Play Sweet Nations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have over two dozen podcasts available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaySweetNation.com. We now offer them to you on two great feeds. On the PlaySweetNation Wrestling feed, we dive into topics running the gamut from today's WWE to the glory days of yesteryear and the ins and outs of the territory days. In addition to our full-length shows, we also deliver to you special pod blasts on topics old and new. The Place to Be Nation pop feed is a veritable treasure trove of great content. Offer tremendous shows covering the land of movies, television, life, comics, and sports. Brought to you by the most knowledgeable and insightful folks in the podcast world. You can find all these great shows, plus archives of our past podcasts from over the past eight years as well, by subscribing to both feeds on iTunes. And while you're there, be sure to rate and leave feedback as well. All of these shows, plus others, available on placementation.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth search projects, and much more. Be sure to support our site by using www.placementation.com forward slash Amazon when doing your online shopping. We want to thank our friends at Bonehead's Wing Bar, ProWrestlingOnly.com, and HistoryOfWrestling.com as well. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. Placementation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world.
place to be nation wrestling. Welcome back to Talkin' WCW, where tonight we are talking some War Games matches. And before we get back to it with our final match that we'll be examining on this edition, we've got to tell you about some happenings around the nation that you can get in on. Starting first on our sister feed, that being the Place to Be Nation pop feed, we have the Marvel Age podcast, which I am one quarter of, the Sarcastic Four, delving into 1971. It's going to be the first of three parts covering that year. Check that out, Place to Be Nation pop. We also had the eighth episode of laugh in theater with andy he welcomed hard traveling fanboy greg phillips hey greg hey How was that episode what did you uh what movie did you watch with andy there i watched uh one of my favorite movies of all time austin powers international man of mystery and uh, had a wonderful time chatting about this great film with andy i will be honest to listeners before they delve into that one i am fairly certain i didn't contribute much to it because i found myself watching the movie and just giggling yeah. like rick flair on a podcast yeah that'll happen with laughing theater i i know the feeling well uh, of course you and your regular compatriot nick duke other half of the hard traveling fanboys you guys concluded x-men month x month as i like to call it did a long book hunters and reviewed ed piscor's x-men grand design what a Ambitious exercise in, in retconning for the, the sake of the narrative to yes. make a better story. And that's it's not really what you do with retcons most of the time. So very, uh, very interesting experiment there by one Ed Piscor. And uh, you guys did a great job bringing that up. Uh, and Grand Design, that series is now finished. So yes, and, perhaps and- you'll be revisiting it. Perhaps so. In fact, I, I this doesn't happen to me very often anymore with comics, unfortunately. But uh, I, I was so amped after reading this this X Men Grand Design, kind of a spoiler for the podcast, I guess. But I was so amped after reading this, I, I wanted to see what he did next. So I went ahead and started reading Second Genesis, the uh, the I guess the parts two and three of this six part uh, story. And uh, have really enjoyed that to this point as well. I haven't finished it yet, but I'm enjoying reading it. And so I'm, I'm going to read it all the way through, man. They, they, he's, he's hooked me on this. I have to see how he manages to, um, how he manages to translate the, the increasingly galactic and uh, widespread stakes of the X-Men universe. Yeah, no doubt. One to look forward to. I, I want to get my hands on that, too. Um, something I actually want to physically own. And I don't own mm-hmm. physical media, especially physical comics, too, too often these days. So that says a lot. So the newest weekly comic show on Place Nation Nation Pop, that is DC for you with Russell Sellers and the manager, Todd Weber. They give you uh, monthly current events in the DC comic book world. So for June of this year, they're going to be covering all the happenings in DC Comics. We had another edition of Songs with Friends. They're up to episode 29 now. And that was Steve and Kelly covering Kenny Chesney's The Good Stuff. And then Fuel's Shimmer. Wow, getting flashbacks there to uh, 2001. Geek and Sassy, Jenny, Mm -hmm. this is you. And me. And you. And Miranda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, special guest joining you two lovely ladies. We did a a recap of season two and preview of season three starting soon, starting as of maybe the time you're hearing this podcast, stranger things. Uh, Anything else you'd like to, to tell folks to titillate them with that episode, that drop of geek and sassy. With that drop of geek and sassy, you can look forward to um, things like my hatred of Nancy Mm. Um, She's a sweetheart. My lust of Hopper. Okay, Daddy Hopper. Very good. All right. We also had the Glenn Butler Spectacular 
that being Glenn and his brother Scott, they discussed slash debated the slate of Democratic hopefuls for the upcoming 2020 presidential election. Boy, are there a lot of them. But check out that show. Pretty insightful, um, pretty entertaining as well. Uh, and then finally, NBA team podcast, Adam Murray, Andrew Reich, they are reflecting on what has been quite the last week in NBA land. Are are the playoffs finally done, guys? Bring me uh, up on this. Smart me n- up. No. Uh, my understanding, Tim, is that the NBA playoffs will continue uh, through the end of 2019. Actually, after they start the next season, this past season's playoffs are still going to be going. How many? What period are we in of of the playoffs? Are are we at the 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 game beyond yet? We we are not. We are in period four right now, and uh, out of a possible seven periods, and mm-hmm. so the, the the game beyond is not even started. Gosh, Larry Zabisco is actually coming off the bench for the Golden State <laughs> Warriors in this one, so uh, it should be interesting to watch. Oh my goodness, Jenny, why don't you tell the folks about? the next big project that you can vote on in Place to Be Nation World. The next one is our uh, Greatest Songs of the 80s Tournament, which has been rebooted and has started back. So you can like our Facebook page, PTBN's, I think it's Place... No, it's PTBN's. Is it? Okay. Yep. Uh, yep. PTBN's uh, Greatest Songs of the 80s. You just like our page, and then you'll see the polls daily. We have six yep. polls. And you just click your little favorite we, one there. And then... We love when you see our polls. Yes. <laughs> oh. Well, we're doing this on Twitter as well, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so mm-hmm. like That's I told reference. him, in which he told me I was being ridiculous, but if you have trouble deciding between two songs, you can just vote mm-hmm. on one on Facebook and the other yep. on Twitter. I like that. And he told me it that just cancels but... out my own vote, mm-hmm. but I, mm-hmm. I don't see it that way. It's true, though. I mean, you must acknowledge that it is both true, and yet your approach is valid. Yes. You have to follow your heart, so That's what I you do. do what you need to do. Mm-hmm. It's like that classic Madonna 80s song. Open your heart to voting in two different polls, mm. maybe. Something like that. Has that song come up yet? I don't think it has. Okay. I know there have been several Madonna songs, or oh, yeah. Madge, as they call her. <laughs> is that what they call her? I, I don't. I saw that somewhere. I, I don't know if anyone actually Madge. said that in real life. I saw it on Twitter. Somebody called her Madge. Is that her British like, name? I don't know. It might be. She did develop into somewhat of a Brit over time. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that, of course. Yeah. Notable affectation there. Uh, Greg, yes, what, is girl, what, what is going on on our native feed, Place to be Nation Wrestling? I'm so glad you asked. Uh over on the Place to Be podcast, Justin Scott and Steve Bennett are back inside the home office for a deep dive into the 9-30-89 Madison Square Garden house show. So this would have been post-SummerSlam, pre-Survivor Series, uh, building up undoubtedly the ongoing feud between Randy Savage, Zeus, and... Uh, and Hulk Hogan and his friends, unless they weren't on this house show, in which case I retract everything I just said. Well, JT, and, yeah. <laughs> JT and Chad open up the 1996 pay-per-view year with a look at the Royal Rumble on the latest Wrestling Warzone. Curious to get their take on this show. I'm a huge uh, Bret Hart fan. Not my favorite Bret Hart championship match on this one, as he wrestled oh, the Undertaker. Oh, I just yeah, I just remember which one. Yeah, ooh, yeah. that's a rough one in a in a babyface match. Not not the best, uh, not the best match in the world. But we'll see what JT and Chad have to say. PDB and staff members Jennifer Smith, mm-hmm. hello there, Hi. Drew Wardlaw, and Matt Souza gather together to break down the. Hidden Gem Collection now of the 1986 Crockett Cup. Tell us about this podcast, Jenny. It was super fun. So uh, the the Crockett Cup there in 1986 was the very first one. Um, and so if you really enjoy 80s tag team wrestling, this is the show for you. If you enjoy no commentary, this is also the show for <laughs> you. Uh, but I had a really, really fun time talking about it with Drew and Matt. And it was Matt's first podcast, and he did a great job. Oh, it's compliments to Matt then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is something very, very near and dear to our hearts. And I'm glad that it came from your 
editorial office, Jenny. Yes. Yes, and I, I think I'm interested in checking this show out. I plan on watching it soon, so and then listening to the pod to accompany it. So that should be fun. Maybe if they release all the Crockett Cup footage that they have, one day we can do a Crockett Cup talk in WCW. Wouldn't that be something? That would be amazing. Um, because yeah, this was not the only year of the Crockett Cup, as we know. Mm-hmm. So, in the tenth episode of Row One, Seat One, Ben welcomes documentary filmmaker and wrestling superfan John. Filipavage to the podcast on the ep- on episode number one twenty nine of main event. I love you for that. Me too. Hot, Nate and Steve preview AEW's Fighter Fest ROH's best in the world and recap classic total nonstop action from two thousand and two. Did you guys check out Fighter Fest over the weekend? Oh my god, yes. Parts of it, yes. Yes. Parts of it. What do you mean? Yeah, parts of I didn't it? get. I didn't get in until. Mm, I had a non wrestling fan at my house, so she wasn't oh. all about it, and um, so we checked out like kind of part of one match, and she was like, eh, "I don't know about this," and so I had to kind of put it on pause until mm. later on. But I saw, I saw some good Tragic. shit. Yeah, I saw the Moxley mm. match. It was really fun. There was some good shit. I mean, I I have my issues about certain things that aren't yep. worth yep. getting into mm-hmm. here, but top to bottom, I thought it was thoroughly mm-hmm. entertaining Highly and good. kind of a breath of fresh air. So yeah, yeah, I thought uh, I thought uh, Cody and Darby Allen had a really good match. Mm-hmm. I thought um, the uh, six man tag was really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, the women, I thought the triple threat match with the women was was really yeah. good. So. Mm-hmm. Um, really good stuff all around. Exciting stuff from AEW. Somewhat reminiscent, even when, even in some of the minor production issues, somewhat reminiscent of our beloved WCW at times. So exactly, and that's the thing. I I kind of love how Cody is this not even low key. Like he's just sort of a WCW nerd, mm-hmm. and is you know bringing back a little bit of that mentality, but with more of a contemporary eye towards. Um, let's actually try to do good business and not be stupid about it. <laughs> right. What if what if Cody brings back the King of the Road match? Oh, with that you know, con money, that beautiful con money, I think he might be able to do it. I mean, he's trying to get the his dad's old trademarks, right? Yeah. That mm-hmm. the WWF W wow that Vince hasn't gobbled up yet. So it could have. Hmm. Do you think Vince really had his eye on WCW King of the Road? I bet you that that one has lapsed. I bet, I it, bet, was, I bet it would too. It. And then you've got like uh, you know, think of the other matches you could have. Like the what was that? Uh, the what was the nineteen ninety nine hardcore match they had on pay per view where they're at like a junkyard? What oh, the called? junkyard Invitational. Yes, yes. <laughs> junkyard Invitational. That? What? Yeah, for the for the WCW Hardcore Championship, the mm-hmm. the somewhat short lived WCW Hardcore Championship. I say it's short lived because their champion um, Ming left the promotion and went back to WWE. So that was that. <laughs> but the uh, the interesting. I mean, about a year later, but still. You could also you could also get bring back something like the martial arts challenge from Uncensored ninety five. You mm. could bring back uh, uh, the bunkhouse versus wrestler. Boxer versus wrestler. I would be stunned legitimately if by the end of the year AEW doesn't have a bunkhouse stampede. Oh my god! My god. Anyway, but, but there's, that's not all. We're not done with that yet. No, the we're the, not the done. read yet. Yeah, we're not on place done. on place to be nation dot com. I just spit on myself. That's disgusting. <laughs> That's a good, uh, PT, <laughs> PTBN's tribute to 1994 is off and running with pieces on the Best Picture nominees for the 66th Academy Awards, the 1994 World Cup, and the miniseries The Stand. Also, Excellent Network Adventure Team is back with a look at ECW One Night Stand 2006, a show. Good that, ass show. Yes, it is. Underrated, in my opinion. <clears throat> Check out our social media pages and message board at bigelow34.proboards.com for information on joining our greatest WWE pay-per-view and TV match ever project. 
Uh, get in today on the conversation and start researching your list. This is basically where we compile a list of our 100 favorite matches in the history of World Wrestling Entertainment slash the World Wrestling Federation slash the Worldwide Wrestling Federation slash, if you're Lee West, Capital Wrestling in the 50s. Uh, every great match you've ever encountered from WWE. Well, you know what else we're doing? We are hosting live watches on occasion on about a weekly basis. Take about, oh, I don't know, three to four matches of the ten hundred trillion nominees on the <laughs> greatest WWE pay-per-view and TV match ever project. And we have some fun with them. We sit down, we sync up, and we watch. So want to get on on that action. I would just say kind of hit me up informally, like on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, I am at Psych68 on Twitter, probably the best, most direct, easiest way to reach me, um, or go through one of the aforementioned Facebook groups, however you want to get in touch with me. Come on, it's it's not difficult. Look at you inviting strangers for the DMs. What the hell? I mean, let's just go ahead and blow the doors open. I mean, those group <laughs> watches, you want to get... You want to get I thought we were in exclusive. Me, you know? Are we just doing anybody that just slides in your DMs, Tim? Look, I, I mean, let's face it. I'm pretty desperate for those for those DMs these days. Yeah. So, the exclusivity just, window passed long ago. I agree. It sure did. <laughs> <laughs> and we can uh, always kick them out. We can always just kick them out. Oh, if it doesn't. sure, yeah. Because we've done that well, I'm before. Not yes, that's. I'm so not worried about it. Yeah. Most people kind of self-select out, but that's that's another conversation. Um, he means me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and like like twenty percent of the other or <laughs> just on that refuse chat. to participate, <laughs> even though <laughs> they are still part of the group. <laughs> Occasionally, I'll just check in and see what Tim and Jenny are saying, and I'll yeah, I'll, yep. I'll, I'll laugh and move along. Like, Nod my head. And oh, move they're along. drunk again. <laughs> <laughs> they're talking about oh. analingus again. <laughs> see, you guys want to get in on this chat. I'm just telling you. I'm trying to pitch yeah. this. Well, this is what you want to be a part of. Oh yeah, it's super fun. Yeah. So if you want to be a part of um, that hot action, uh, let us know. So, speaking, speaking of hot of, action, thank you. Perfect segue. <laughs> Took the words out of my mouth. So, no. I want to tell you a little story about what happened to me after I watched um, the match that you picked, Tim. Okay. Um, you picked Fall Brawl 1996. Yes, I did. And so I watched Fall Brawl 1996. And then. You watched the whole show? No. I watched the War Games match. Okay. And then I, unbeknownst to me, the network continued on into 1997's Fall Brawl, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But I paused it somewhere. And so when I came back and I saw it paused on Fall Brawl 97, I thought, oh, fuck. I watched Fall Brawl 97 instead of 96. Hmm. And I had a little mini meltdown because I'm a trash person, and I'm like, of so course, you this you is what up. I did. Yes, but then, but, you did. but then I was like, wait, I I read the wiki for this, and this is what I watched, and like, wait, what? And so I just had a little moment there. But anyway, I was really happy that I didn't have to go back and watch. <laughs> so really. Really, what happened, Jenny, was you, much like the total package Lex Luger, you had a crisis of conscience. Don't ever oh. compare me to Lex Luger. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, <laughs> that's what hey, happened. Well, we're getting, we'll get into this. We're going to have a chance to say a lot of bad things about Lex Luger. Yeah, we will. Lex yeah. Luger, you want to talk about a trash person. Lex Luger <laughs> is the worst friend that there has ever been. There, he is. I, thank well, you for saying that. Well, spoken like so, a sting, Mark, but okay. Okay. Well, oh man. <laughs> See, you're just between a rock and a hard place here because this is some drama that rests on on this long-standing wrestling relationship. That boy, if if you're not if you're not on board for it, it may fall flat for you. So yeah, because we can talk. Jenny, about there's this. like Let's... a year of backstory for this too. Yeah, I, I had a feeling. At was. least, at least, yeah. And this is, we'll just say it's. Again, Fall Brawl, 1996, not 1997, although there is a 
pretty um, infamous War Games match on that show. You should check out. But this was from September 16th of 1996. The... Lawrence Joel Veterans Memorial Coliseum. Why are all of our coliseums and, and arenas that we visited tonight dead? Um, <laughs> well. they're, they're all they're all memorials. They they are deceased. Yes. Uh, but this is in Winston Salem, North Carolina. We are in Horseman, Horseman country. country. We're in fucking mm-hmm. Ric Flair country. It is. Um, okay, so I will just say that. First off, it is hard to believe that this is our first appearance of the New World Order on our our podcast. Um, However, one of the things that I have loved about doing this show is really getting out of my comfort zone. I think it would have been really easy but kind of boring to spend all of the time that I've had doing the show with you guys, just looking at the matches from the very specific WCW Monday Night Wars period, right? Because that's what I'm most familiar with. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think one of the benefits of doing this podcast, and it's a match-centric podcast that we do, is we want to... I don't know about you guys, but I want to talk about actual good matches <laughs> I think that's, or or notably bad matches. You know what I mean? Right. Like right. not not a lot of middle ground there. Um, and it's not something that the NWO period of WCW is known for good matches <laughs> like storylines. Yes, absolutely. Phenomenal storytelling do shit matches. That's mm-hmm. just kind of their legacy. Um, but here, I, I just think we have the perfect balance. It's yep. story and ring work, to me anyway. Yeah. And um, I guess we should maybe provide some context, right? This is mm-hmm. the, it's the, I would consider the second major collision between these two factions since that's, that uh, initial six-man tag, of course, at Bash at the Beach. That's where we saw the formation of the New World Order. And the NWO, it's been running roughshod over WCW for months now. And here we've got some of the promotion's biggest stalwarts. They are putting their differences aside. They're going to take the fight back to these interlopers. They're going to do it at War Games. Uh... And we've got, notably here, both teams basically going into the event claiming the allegiance of Sting, who is near and dear to your heart, Greg, and to yours as well, Jenny. You just have Mm -hmm. to, you just have to admit it. Mm -hmm. Just, just go with it. Mm -hmm. Um, So initially it looks like Sting is WCW through and through, but it's on that go home Nitro and, uh, I believe it was in Columbus, Georgia. Shout out Nick Duke. Lex Luger, here we go again, assaulted in that rain-soaked parking lot of the arena by someone who, he sounds like Sting, looks like Sting. Indeed, Lex Luger believes he is Sting, his very best friend in the wrestling business. And that raises the very real possibility now, going into this pay-per-view, that Sting has defected. And that's what's looming over this match here. Whose side is Sting on? Wow. A lot to unpack. And we will do that. Um, But I just want to turn it over now to you guys. Um... Greg, your thoughts on on this match, being the sting mark that I know you are. This was, from a WCW perspective, probably the most into a storyline that I had ever been as a wrestling fan. Um, Mm -hmm. Certainly WCW. And um, I was a huge sting fan, as you guys know. I remember watching that Nitro. I vividly remember watching that Nitro and I could not believe my eyes when Sting jumps, uh, when Sting attacks Lex outside of that limo, 
mm-hmm. and then the pouring down rain. And I admit, I thought Sting joined the NWO at that point. I was they like, sold it like it was Sting. They they weren't questioning, is this really Sting? I mean, the the announcers were awestruck. And in my head, I'm justifying it. I'm uh, I would have been 12 at this time, so I'm justifying it as well. Maybe Sting's setting them up. So maybe Sting is is trying to infiltrate the New World Order to set them up. Uh, mm-hmm. Surely he wouldn't have sold out. He'd never sell out. Um, so I still had hope that come the pay-per-view, there would be some answers as to what was going on. I never really, I never believed that Sting would sell out to the NWO, but I also, like, I know what I saw, and I thought it was a great twist. Then I was thinking, well, maybe Lex is, at, maybe Sting got when that Lex was a traitor. I don't know. Okay. So yeah. as, as background to all of this, before we get into what happens the night of this show, uh, for the previous year, so Lex Luger returns to WCW about one year ago from where we're at at the show, uh, in the Almost fall exactly. of ni- yep. 1995. And when he comes over, Lex Luger is a slimy, scheming character who gets Jimmy Hart as his manager. And the whole time that he's there, Sting is the only one who supports him because Sting believes that Lex Luger is a good man. He believes that Lex is, is, is a great person, a friend of his that he's known for the last 10 years in the business – and so Hogan and Savage keep telling Sting, hey, this guy's a snake. You can't trust him. And Sting actually steps up to the top baby faces, Hogan and Savage, and tells them, no, if you won't accept Lex, then you can't accept me either. So He's, they, he's maybe flawed, but, but has a good heart. Yeah, he has a good heart. And, 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 the, and Lex plays this up because when Sting's around, Lex will smile and slap the hands of the fans. But the minute that Sting turns his back, Lex is pulling away. And he's, and he's scolding the fans and yelling at them and stuff. <laughs> it's a brilliant storyline. So it, it goes – it lasts over the course of a year to build up. But the point being that Sting went out of his way to believe Lex, to defend Lex after every turn. And so going into this pay-per-view event, there's all this drama and upset and ominous tone in the air. Even the announcers have yes. this air of like they're at a funeral because, my God, Sting defected. Mm-hmm. If Sting defected, the franchise of WCW – then who's left? And yeah, we're um, lost. Basically. We're lost. The the war is lost at this point. If we if we've lost Sting, but by God, we're going to go down fighting. And that's sort of that's sort of the the implication. We're going to go down fighting. They do a promo backstage with Flair and Arn and Lex, where they almost concede defeat because they say we're mm-hmm. the Horsemen aren't even getting involved in this. We're going to have three on four, and we're going to go go to war, baby. And they're 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 ominous. Lex has lost a friend, and then Sting walks in. In a shot that would never happen in WWE because it's not a perfect shot, you get the back yep. of Sting's head and 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 facing the the, the Horseman and Luger, and so uh, as they're standing. Uh, by the way, in this promo, Ric Flair refers to Mike Tanay as Gene. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> Gene, it's an emotional Mike. So, um, uh, so Sting comes in and he says, "Guys, listen, I just." All I want is a moment of your time. All I want is a moment of your time. Arn's ready to fight. Arn's got mm-hmm. his dukes up. Mm-hmm. Flair's saying, no, nah, brother. Mm-hmm. And then Lex, Lex is in the background not willing to listen to a word that Sting's saying. And Sting says, he says, I'm telling you, Lex, it I just want to tell you, me. it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't and then, me, Lex. <laughs> and, then, and then Lex says, I looked at you in the eyes. You're my best friend in the world. I looked you in the eyes. I know it was you. I'm telling you it was you. I know it was you, Sting. And then Sting goes, well, I guess I'll see you out there. And he walks off. So right there, Sting tried. He tried. He reached out and tried to level with them and get them to listen to reason. And Lex says, wrongly, I looked you in the eyes, Sting, and I know it was you. He didn't even know his best friend when he looked him in the eyes. What a lousy excuse well, for a human being. It's like Sluger, so, Luger. I mean, seems right. Well, with I mean, friends like that, Jenny, who needs enemies? Yeah, I mean, with friends like Lex Luger. And I, I'm so glad that you, you brought that up, Greg. And by the way, I could not have said it better myself. That's in a lot of what I wanted to unpack in this match is, you know, there there is enough doubt cast on Sting here. I mean, this is... This is one of those time periods where, like you said, it's so ominous. Just It feels like anything can happen that what you're watching, the NWO are like 
genuinely dangerous, right? Um, in a way that you hadn't really encountered before as a wrestling fan. Just that a, a cloud level, of suspicion. A level of stakes that had never existed in wrestling before. Mm-hmm. The, at least in my eyes. The paranoia, the, the trust that's running wild, uh, it's followed the NWO really since their debut. And there's a feeling like maybe Sting could join this stable after all. Hogan turned, and that was something we thought unthinkable at the time. So if the unthinkable has already happened, then what's left? Just the improbable, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And then again, you're looking at Luger, like you said, always shifty in his own allegiances, especially, you know, just tracing back to his return to WCW. Um, and there was never any real resolution to that tension between himself and Sting that played out earlier in the year, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what had happened was the NWO happened, and they just steamrolled over all of these issues, these kind of simmering issues in the WCW mid-card. And I always go back to that Bash at the Beach tag match where Luger gets taken out pretty early on, which normally you would think like that's telegraphing a a heel turn for him. He's going to be the guy. He's going to be the third man. And they subverted expectations there quite brilliantly, I will add. So Luger kind of emerges as this big baby face who has vindicated and proven right for doubting Hogan all along. But he's still kind of a weasel, you know. He's he's still Lex Luger. He's kind of an asshole. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, and going into this match, we also have to consider that he is teaming here with Ric Flair, with Arn Anderson. They are three quarters of what was a pretty dominant early iteration of the Four Horsemen, who mm-hmm. have some experience with this type of match. And these were the guys that Luger was palling around with when he debuted in WCW all the way back in 1987. Uh, They know each other. They work extremely well together. But is Sting going to be able to coexist with this group? Well, we see what what goes down here. Um, Turns out that, you know, never should have doubted Sting, Mm -hmm. Lex Luger. Because the one time, the one time this guy asks Luger, his best friend, to put his faith in him. And this means a lot coming from Sting, by the way. The, the, the dude who has always, you know, extended the hand to anybody who's asked for it, no yep. matter how many times he was stabbed in the back. The one time he wants that trust reciprocated, he doesn't get it. And, ugh, I just... I just and, thought that played out so beautifully. And <laughs> not just and not just his best friend, but the people who had never turned their backs on him, the fans. Yeah. Uh, so many of the fans doubted. And just the fact that they doubted was enough to push him over the edge because he was somebody that had given everything to WCW, had always done the right thing. Even when people like Hogan or Savage were being dicks to him, he was always going out of his way to do the right thing. And there was a segment of the fan base that doubted that thought he had joined the NWO and he couldn't care less what Ric Flair or Arn Anderson think of him. But the fact that Luger and the fans didn't trust him and didn't give him the benefit of the doubt made him think that all of his years of sacrifice not been worth it. So yeah, it's really operatic if you think about it. And then I know I'm skipping ahead of the match here, but fast no, forwarding yeah. a year and how this plays into the ultimate storyline of sting and his ultimate redemption, it it really makes Hollywood Hogan even more of a great villain. Because mm. it's almost this like this Emperor Palpatine like long form game that Hogan is playing here where he's so by sowing the seeds of dissension with stuff like the giant turn uh, and his own turn, Hogan manages to take WCW's greatest weapon away from it in the form of Sting. Uh, which basically takes him off the board for an entire calendar year and allows the NWO to gain this giant strategic advantage. And only, only in the latter half of 97 do we see 
uh, the the plans start to fall apart as Sting gets his wits about him and gets a plan of attack and starts to starts to show his face again on the side of the good guys. So, such yeah. great long form storytelling here. Absolutely, Jenny. We haven't heard too much from you. We've been dominating this with our Sting loving here, as Greg and I are want to do. What what was your takeaway here? Story and match, whichever, wherever you want to start. Um, well, like I said, I, I enjoy listening to you guys, you know, what you guys think about it. So uh, trust me, I'm not bored at all listening to that. Um, I was in a real shitty mood when I mm. turned this match on. I just, I was just like, <sighs> I just have to get this done, you know, for the podcast and um, make my sacrifices like I do. You know, well, like mm-hmm. a, like a yeah, grown mm-hmm. up, and then this match turned my mood around. Oh um, my God. It, I, you know, I've kind of been very picky on the cages that we talked about, um, but this cage I think probably stood up the best of uh, the three yeah. that mm-hmm. we watched. They kind of got it together, but yeah, by this. they were they uh, knew how to like solder things together or <laughs> <laughs> something. Klondike, Klondike had managed to focus uh, yeah. much more on yeah. this one. He, uh, <clears throat> he got the panties out of his mouth or whatever. I don't know, but <laughs> he was on the ball. But um, Oh, wow. That was almost spit take. But how much do I love Arn Anderson? It just, it, yeah. He just In makes rare... everything better, just so much better. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we, gave, we served you up some Arn here. I mean, if, if nothing else, you, you had to be... You know, he started the match, so in a you're rare see a glimpse lot of, of Arn. babyface Arn Anderson yes, too. Yes, mm-hmm. which I, I don't know. It's so good. I, as much as I love the bad guys, I, I I don't know. Whatever he wants to do, he can just do, and I will just buy it. I don't care. Well, the he great does. thing is he he still has the attitude of badass horseman double A here. It's it's not like he's been watered down now mm-hmm. as a character. Playing, playing the babyface role. It's just he's up against this faction that's hated even more than the Horsemen Horsemen, now. yeah, yeah. It, uh, it such an odd spot for him, you know, really. Um, yeah. I can't imagine, like, how he, uh, how he, how he must have felt there. Um, but anyway, um, I love Dusty, of course, so that's yes. just another... Wonderful addition to this. He's so, it's so funny how United, uh, Dusty and even Bobby and Tony yeah. are, um, mm-hmm. and, and Bobby is just incredulous that he's agreeing with things that Tony and Dusty say. <laughs> um, Bobby has a real tough time during this match. He, mm-hmm. uh, he takes it real hard and, um, doesn't it add to the sense of stakes? It does. Like to, it really does. To, I always thought that because, like, but just this lifelong cartoonish heel of Bobby Heenan suddenly <laughs> treating this like this is life and death. Yeah. Like, and he's on the side for once of the same side that the fans are on. That that by God, our our livelihoods are on the line here. This is not just wrestling. This is not just championships. This is our livelihood here. And I get the feeling that he's just itching to be like part of it. You know, he mm-hmm. kind of wants to be in on it. And he's he's frankly maybe sloshed uh, during his commentary. <laughs> there. Sounded a little, uh, yeah. We'll see, but um, but I I thought that uh, Dusty, as much as like Heenan was sort of um, like angsty about it, Dusty was more like on the fence about it. Like he he was. He was firmly against NWO, but he still um, wanted to, like, I don't know, be dusty about it. I don't mm-hmm. know. He was, he was great. He was wonderful. I love him so much. And then, um, <clears throat> well, he's conflicted, I think, because as much as he hates the NWO, he has this long history with the Horsemen, right? And right, he's trying to be like the company guy here and rally the troops yes. and. He has a great call early on where he just he starts marking out and he goes, "Go with it, double A." Yeah, and yes, it, he I even wrote that acknowledges. Down. <laughs> he acknowledges to himself that he cannot believe. Yeah, I, I can't believe I'm saying that right now. I can't believe I'm saying what I'm saying. But you get on him, double A. 
<laughs> I can't believe I'm for double A. <laughs> and it just goes to show just how effectively they are selling this this paradigm shift in the company. And Dusty even – because this is his baby. War Games is Dusty's – Yes. Most, that's the creation he's proudest of in wrestling. And so when when the match starts, he draws on that history and he says, I'm going to tell you what could be the key to this match right here is Arn Anderson mm-hmm. has fought in more War Games matches mm-hmm. than any other competitor. Mm-hmm. That could be the difference in our favor. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> And you buy it. I mean, you really, it, it has a certain credibility to it. And then, okay, so um, I'm not going to say I, I totally um, bit on the fake sting, but like I might have bit a little bit on the fake sting. Sure. He did a good job of mimicking uh, looked, Sting's movement. Yes. Those um, splashes in the corners, mm-hmm. I was like, oh. And even the back, the backhanded punches that he was doing. Yeah, I mean stink. that dude looked yeah. legit look like Stink. They look identical. And I admit I'm a noob. I don't know shit, but it, I bought. I bought. And it helped that it was in Sting's uh, weird like uh, hair phase, where yeah. he had, where his, it kind of got the shaggy hair going a little bit. Um, and he so, wore the jacket. I mean, I just yeah. it, I, I bought it, and um, <laughs> and then when the when the real scene came out, I was like, of course, of course I bought it. <laughs> of course it was the <laughs> fake scene. Um, and then, um, wow, uh, Bobby's losing his mind. Um, mm-hmm. Nobody knows what's going on. It's like this, as much as the the previous match felt like a, like I said, like an orgy and where everybody was doing something quality wherever you looked this sort of broke down a lot quicker to where you got to where guys were just standing around watching Mm -hmm. guys do things and it it wasn't as action-packed um story kind of takes over towards yeah yeah it takes over the 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 wrestling part of it and i get it and i that works for me i'm good for i'm good with that but i actually was surprised that you did pick this match tim because as extra as it gets um towards the end i thought it might be a little bit over the line for you like what are we doing no no i well i'll tell you what it is um it is a lot of story but i've talked about how i think the story and the match kind of complement one another so well. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we haven't talked too much about the match itself, just the content of the body of work for what it is. It doesn't have the spots that the other matches had. Right, it it doesn't quite have those same spots. And no no blood. No blood, that's true. No blood, that's kind of a mark against it a little bit, but... I mean, I did kind of think everybody got their shit in and got a little bit of shine. So, yeah. you know, that worked for me pretty well. But, oh, and God, the talk about the, the horseman in a face position. Arn Anderson as a face. Talk about Flair. Mm-hmm. The heel face role reversal between Flair and Hogan. That is just so unusual. And Wild always, to watch, man. Yeah, it, that's fascinating to me anyway for for how rare it really is um but what about the shot where flair just starts going nuts with the ball shots on everybody (laughs) (laughs) it is getting cheered for it yes i mean people are going nuts for for this flair being the dirtiest player in the game but you know fighting the good fight for a change here he and hogan Uh, get a really good like head-to-head they get a little sequence yeah Yeah. they, they they get a nice sequence here uh, and I, I, I guess I will just to try to make the point for the match itself. I thought that the time intervals, specifically in a oh my god games match, it, it served the storyline and and furthered the storyline very very well. Mm-hmm. Like that fourth man reveal, um, and the build to it is just so electric. And when nwo sting comes out it kind of confirms everyone's worst fears you know and it's super deflating for two minutes anyway because Mm -hmm. such is the structure of the match 
that's not the end. We're going to do this for two minutes, all hope is lost, and then, boom, here comes the real, genuine article, Sting. Um, and by the way, I'll mention kind of shoot the way that you you know just film and shoot a a war games match you're the visuals are a little bit obscured right you're trying to shoot through the cage and there's a lot going on and you can't see things as well as you would in a regular wrestling ring so i think that aspect lends itself very well to just helping to obscure (laughs) this guy's identity that he's not the real sting although Mm -hmm. He's got the mannerisms down. He's got the look, but just the fact that you can't see him right clearly. And you know, there's a there's a pocket of fans when he when the fake Sting gets in there that starts chanting, "We want Sting." So there's mm-hmm. some of the live crowd was already in on it that this this is not the real Sting in a yep. way that we couldn't necessarily tell watching it on TV. Yep, exactly. Um. So, so that's why I, I say particularly this match and the structure and just the whole mm-hmm. how you book a War Games match, just kind of textbook booking, by the way, but complements the story that they're they're trying to sell here so very effectively. Um, I mean, of course, you've got the NWO oozing confidence, knowing that they hold all the cards here knowing that they don't really have Sting in their corner, but they've sown enough doubt to just undermine WCW. And when Sting finally makes his presence felt, you're thinking, okay, this is going to turn the tide of the match now on WCW. Mm -hmm. And it does. I mean, he's clean in house, right? But because everyone doubted him, he walks out. And he's making the point demonstrating to to his teammates they could have beaten the NWO if they had just trusted him and worked together. He's telling them, look, guys, my way works. If you had just signed on, we could have done this. But nope. Yep. One time I asked you to do this, to meet me halfway, like I've done so many times in the past, you wouldn't do it. So you know what? Fuck you. This is what you Almost literally what he says, and and like Luger Luger comes after him, and he says, "Was that good enough for you?" And then he then he flips him off basically and leaves. Was that good enough for you? Yeah, walks yeah. out. And now, I mean, this is it. We're now we're at the match beyond, right? So uh, he's hung WCW out to dry effectively, and Luger such a like adding insult to. To injury here, where he has to submit now to the fake sting with the the scorpion deathlock. So with the scorpion deathlock with Hollywood Hogan applying a face lock to him as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> but I yeah, just, I don't know. A, Maybe I'm gushing too much for this match. I I've seen it a million times, but I I always find more to love every time I go back to this match. I was going to say, this is not a match that I remembered very fondly as a match. I remembered the angle very well and loved it. But I enjoyed this more than I thought I would, going back and watching it. I really had a lot of fun watching it. Um, I thought the commentary was great, which Jenny was talking about earlier. It, it added, I love the stakes of it. I love that feeling that something genuine is on the line here in a way that maybe it wasn't in previous War Games matches. This actually felt like the winning team was going to be getting something out of this other than just revenge. And even though there were no necessarily, I don't know if there were any stakes attached to the match, but it was just the I, the feel of it was different. Like, my God, this is life and death. Mm-hmm. The commentary was great. The, the, the guys, the, the match, you know, there was, it didn't do anything. It didn't reinvent the wheel. But you got the outsider's mm-hmm. edge. You got the jackknife. You got the big leg. You got the figure four. Yeah. You got the spine buster. You know, they got moments to shine. Uh, the NWO got their asses kicked for a little while, which was nice to see. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and you got the impression that Sting could have ended this war before it really got, got going. You know, Sting could have put an end to this right now, but because of the brilliant plan of Hollywood Hogan, it didn't come to pass. And instead, the NWO maintains its momentum over in the war against WCW, 
And so I, I, I thought it was great storytelling. It's not as action packed as 92 or 91, but uh, on the other hand, it's it, it's a match that feels like it means more in some ways because of what's on the line. And because of all the post-match. I mean, it just yes, kept going yeah. on and on and on. Yep. And they, like, sneakily, like, lifted the cage up off the ring, like, very, like, slyly. It was very well done because I didn't notice it. And mm-hmm. and then uh, Liz, well, Savage comes out and gets his beating, of course, like he does. <laughs> uh, Hogan. And then... Um, Fucking Liz runs out there. I'm like, oh my god, Liz! And then he, yeah. and then Hogan like spray paints her dress. I'm like, oh my shit! What is going on right here? Mm-hmm. Giant we're, we're comes already, out. Yeah, already heating up the next thing here. And and it's, it's just pretty much chaos at this point. It, you get that that shot of Lex Luger crawling up the aisle, yes. even though he's lost the match, begging for his friend to come back. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I particularly enjoyed that that shot right there but hogan is such a fucking dick oh my he god. really is he's he, such a great bad guy oh here oh my god i wanted him I, you just keep waiting for savage to make the comeback right like no, savage is he's but done. he's i mean the giant the giant lifted him seemingly 25 feet in the air yeah, like three it. times <laughs> the giant by the oh. way how freaking awesome was the big show like I, mean, I know. Yeah. Right. What a, I mean, literally yeah. awesome. Like in in the textbook definition of that. Like, what what a freak of nature in all the best ways. Like he, um, I will say that he is a he is a stay tuned for this podcast. If if one of you guys don't choose the giant in WCW, I will at some point. I already know my giant match. But anyway, mm. um, okay. very good. And then I mean, it, it like I said, it just keeps going on and on. They. They just, you know, kind of get Liz kind of like limping Savage off, and then they take over the commentator's booth. <laughs> so <laughs> Bobby's already just heartbroken, and then mm-hmm. Tony and Dusty just leave, and they get on the they put the headsets on. Yeah. You know, Nash puts the headset on, and it's just it's just done. It's their show now. Like this is what it is now. The. Uh... The the level of vitriol from the announcers while this is happening. Oh my god! Too, yeah, they, 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 yeah. They, Hollywood Hogan is the lowest form of humanity that has ever existed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like Bobby, and then Bobby Heenan gets a great bit where he starts talking about like, listen, guys, I've done a lot of bad things over mm-hmm. the years. I've done things that I'm not proud of. I never did anything like yep. this. This is mm-hmm. th- that is the worst form of scum I've ever seen in my life. Uh, we are amazing. we are like one step removed. From calling him a human commode, <laughs> as Paul Bearer would uh, would bear the brunt of. Um, I will say, speaking of Hollywood Hogan here, this match is sort of a sneaky good look at his, for lack of a better term, just ring generalship, um, mm-hmm. which I know a lot of people don't think of when it comes to Hogan matches, but he's a heel now, and traditionally speaking, the heel is going to call the match and is going to dictate the pace here. And for him to have spent as much of his career as a face, making the hot come back, having to sell, feed and sell, you know, that whole thing. Now he's got to really carry, carry the match. And for as much as a, let's say minimalist as Hogan is in ring, he more than carries his end of the bargain here in this mm-hmm. match. Just when he comes in and kind of reasserts that advantage for the NWO, I I thought that the the landscape of the match really shifted, and it it kind of hit that that second gear. You know? Yes, I agree. Uh, and and he allows himself to get his ass kicked mm-hmm. in a way that yeah. that you wouldn't necessarily associate with Hulk Hogan. A lot of people think, even as Hollywood Hogan, that he just dominated matches, and in some cases he did, but I think this is an example of him really uh, uh, showing a lot of ass, so to speak, and letting Ric Flair, a guy that he had dominated in the past, right. uh, kind of flip the tables on him. And, to your point, Tim, puts in a better night of work than Hall and Nash did, I thought. Yeah, he kind of did, mm. yep. Which is, I mean, Hall is kind of, I mean, if there's any workhorse yeah. of the NWO, yeah. it's yeah. hard to say. It's mm. 
probably Scott Hall. It's a smart choice starting the match with him, especially with mm-hmm. Arn. But yeah, Hogan, credit to him, he put in work here. Um, minor touch that I thought was worth commenting on. You'll notice that the teams aren't all out there at once, as we've seen Mm -hmm. in other matches. They come out one at a time. Mm -hmm. And that just goes back to my point about how the NWO are holding all the cards here. Mm -hmm. Uh, At the same time, they know that they are not going to show their hand. Like, we know that Hall, Nash, and Hogan are in the match, but we don't know who that fourth man is. So just furthering those mind games that, that they're playing and how they're taking advantage of just the egos and WCW and, and playing everyone against each other. Just and again, good and again Tony, Tony brings it up on commentary. Guys, I don't believe I've ever seen a War Games match where they're not at ringside. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and another thing, Nick Patrick, the evil referee oh, in, yeah. the, in the cage. Yes, yeah, on the inside weird. of the cage. Um, and Tony brings that up. I've never seen a, a referee on the inside of a war game. Maybe it was Dusty that brought it up. But, yeah, I think that, that approach, uh, Tim, worked. it would not have worked, I don't think, as well in previous war games matches. But for this right, one, it was right. the dramatic, cor- mm-hmm. dramatically correct choice to make. Yep. Mm-hmm. So the NWO planned for this. They knew it would happen. Mm-hmm. And WCW just... <laughs> played into their hands perfectly. Good, like, good stuff in the formative like, days of this or, this new world organization of wrestling. And like any great evil plan, there's that moment where they, they have to have a moment of doubt. If Maybe we were wrong, brother. Yeah. When Sting comes in and starts laying them out, and you, ha- you know they have to think to themselves, maybe we miscalculated. You know, we didn't think he'd come back and do it. And then he leaves. And then it's like everything yep. is going according to plan. Yeah, they did their work. Now good. they have they have Miss Elizabeth involved. They can make her, her uh, say that she loves uh, uh, Rand, or loves Hogan, even though she Just don't. don't. <laughs> so, Love you for that. It's it's I mean, the birth of the the birth. I mean, of, it's coming up. I mean, watch it the, is. This is what I was looking into. So it's. It's only a few weeks out, and and it's uh, it's it's building into an evil version of you know, <laughs> uh, that, that you can you know, and you get a little glimpse of that in the corner. I don't think he says it here, but he and the giant cut a promo into the camera in the corner of the ring after they're while they're beating yeah. down Savage, and, and he doesn't say you know, but I can tell that he it's a silent you know, uh, where it's like you know I, you can fill it in, be like you know, the giant here. <laughs> It's gonna show Macho Man exactly what the NWO is all about, dude. Ah, <laughs> oh, tremendous! So, all that is to say, I love this match. Uh, like I said, I, I think I love it more every time I watch it. And I also believe that, to the extent any war games or just big time NWO match can be considered a hidden gem, that this sort of qualifies. You and think so? People, I do, because people tend to remember this angle pretty well, but the match itself, I think, is a bit forgotten, and I would just implore people to, with all of this in mind, with all of this background, all of this context, everything we've talked about, reflected on how effective the story is, just fire up the match and try to enjoy it. Jenny, you said it turned your mood around, which I think speaks volumes for a Fucking pro wrestling match. It did, so, considering there wasn't any blood in it. I mean, usually that's what does. I know. Me, I know. I'm right there with I you. I mean, maybe seeing Elizabeth get spit on and like spray mm. painted did something for me, but oh my! <laughs> <laughs> I am an evil bitch. So. Uh, me too. <laughs> Elizabeth was looking pretty fetching at this time. Was she? Not a fan. Nah, I never have been a fan wow. of Elizabeth. I'm like the only one. But wow. that's a controversial statement. What about what about woman? Woman's woman's good. Sherry's yeah. my favorite. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Mm-hmm. So I stand behind it. I love this match. I hope everyone else does too. Uh, God, what else, you guys? God, what I, else? 
I liked the match a lot too. I'm glad you picked it, Tim. It, it, we, I thought we had a very, very good cross section of war games matches here. Good war games matches, I should say, where each of the matches was different. Each of them had a different story that it was telling, and I thought each of them w- was good in their own rights. Um, so yeah, enjoyed the whole, the whole exercise. Do you guys have any honorable you- mentions when it comes to war games? Oof, yes. Yes, uh, the original War Games, the very first one, yeah. uh, which you, if you go onto the WWE Network and go into the collections, there's actually a War Games collection that has all of the available filmed, televised War Games that they have right now at their disposal. Uh, there may be some fan cam footage of other ones, I don't know. But uh, I would recommend really any of the first three War Games, those first two in 87 that were televised and uh, 88. Um, also, yeah. all three of those are wonderful. Um, I'm trying to think of another. Of course, the 94 War Games, which we've already reviewed here. We, on, we covered, yeah. yes. On the podcast uh, is, a, is a very good one. Probably the best No Blood War Games, I think, was that one. And uh, another one that may be divisive, uh, I really like the 97 one. I think it's a good, I, good match. I almost, yeah, I, I almost went with that one. I just felt like it was a little too obvious as War Games matches mm-hmm. went. Because mm-hmm. like you, I was I was saying, I was like, okay, you could do 87, at least what's on the network, very easily, 97 at the same time. So right away, I sort of disqualified them, even though I, mm-hmm. I really do enjoy them a lot. I... I will say that I almost went in a di- different direction as well <laughs> by choosing uh, 93 with um, of course, the Shockmaster, <laughs> which <gasps> just has to be seen to be believed. Um, and then, I mean, talk about going in a different direction. Almost, I mean, just for the briefest glimmer of a second considered war games 2000 which only because it is one of the most garbage shit matches you, you will see in wcw <laughs> the match might have sucked bro but the ratings dude <laughs> they suck too they suck too but listen that's the point steve that's what i've been telling you steve bro that was the idea <sighs> All right. Well, whose turn is it to pick next? That's a great question. I think it's Greg. Yeah, I think it's mine, and I think I already know (gasps) what I'm going to pick for our next show. I think, uh, and and if it's if you guys would like, I can go ahead and yeah, why not? Please let's let's start a tradition here of of revealing our hand, unlike the NWA (laughs) at War Games '96. So we've done tag teams, we've done solo wrestlers, we've done. A, uh, a match type now. I want to kind of get back to a solo wrestler, though, but I want to do something different that we haven't done. We've done very much the Southern, traditional WCW style of wrestling. Mm-hmm. I want to go back and I want to highlight a different style of wrestling that WCW mm-hmm. also brought to the forefront. And so for my selection, I'm going to profile uh, what I feel is the greatest high flyer of all time, Rey Mysterio Jr. Yeah. Mm. Wow! I like it. Bold I choice. love me some WCW Ray. Mm-hmm. Ooh, yeah. Well, now we'll be spending, I would venture to say, a bit more time in the '90s, in the late '90s, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. we haven't done too much of here on this show. Yeah. So, with all that being said, Greg Phillips. Where can people find you on the social social meds, as we say, because we're into a briefs <laughs> on this show? Well, people can see me tweet about Madge and other things <laughs> at gphillips8652, uh, and uh, I am happy to follow back anyone who follows me. Okay. You got anything coming up, any podcasts, any other ventures you'd like to promote? Uh, well, Hard Traveling Fanboys, we are uh, currently in the midst of Spider Month. Uh, we're just a theme monthing away at mm. the HTF every month now, it seems. Oh. And so we are, uh, we've are we got a month of Spider-Man-related activities. We're reviewing the brand-new movie, Spider-Man Far From Home. We're going to take a look at uh, uh, a classic Spider-Man story, Craven's Last Hunt, uh, with, by J.M. DeMatteis. 
Uh, we are going to take a look. Uh, what else are we going to do this month? We're going to do a countdown of our favorite Spider-Man villains, which was we've already recorded that one, and it was certainly a unique episode given my controversial takes on some classic Spider-Man villains. Um, and uh, we're going to go finally off the page to do Sam Raimi's original Spider-Man movie. And uh, this has been many years in the making because I have spent the better part of two decades arguing why uh, Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin is a god-awful doo-doo shit performance. (laughs) Uh, However, it appears my opinion may be changing. What? I'm not ready to acknowledge it yet. Nick's convinced it's going to happen, but we're going to see. We're going to rewatch the movie, and we're going to see if my take on Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin has changed since 2002. Wow. That is impressive. That is a stacked slate Mm -hmm. on the hard-traveling fanboys. You know, no big deal. It's just the longest-running weekly weekly episodic episodic comic comic book book podcast podcast in in all places places. in the (laughs) nation. Good enough for government I was really proud of Andy for getting it right, too, on Laughing Theater. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, he did. Andy's, Andy's great. Andy is great. I agree. Jenny, where can people find you on the social meds? On the social meds, I'm on at social meds. <laughs> Jenny Cruz, two eight one four, and um, like we've talked about, I had the um, Stranger Things Geek and Sassy episode with you, Tim, and then with me. With you. And then I had the Crockett Cup 86 episode with Drew and Matt. So check Mm -hmm. both of those out. And uh, that's all I got so far. Yeah. And as I said earlier, you can find me on Twitter at Psyche68, C-Y-K-E-6-8. I think you've kind of already covered my upcoming podcast or immediate past podcast Mm -hmm. appearances Mm -hmm. popping those peasies for me to say should have another marvel age podcast coming up uh just in the weeks ahead not too far out from our second installment of 1971 on marvel age beyond that um yeah just stick around for next month where evidently we will be covering ray mysterio He was junior in WCW. So, we will see you next month on Talkin' WCW.